Miramba Annie again like Paul um, if uh, she continued uh, in her, if you like, self-effacement would become too invisible for my liking. Uh, it is somebody who says that they are going to talk to you just simply about the African heritage who works very simply on rites of passage among the black community for many, many years, who very simply has opened an African-centered school program in a place called Harlem, who very simply and modestly has written a book called Uguru, uh, which is praised by people such as Dr. Wade Nobles, Dr. John Henry Clark, and others, as a defining classic in African-centered theory. So if I have tried to be invisible, it is to say to you that uh, Sis Annie is far from invisible in terms of the depth of her analysis, her commitment to the black community, and her daily work among the black community in which education for her is an act of worship. So, in that same spirit, may I move you over to uh, Sister Annie, and I hope I didn't overdo it. Sister Annie, give her a pause for a minute. Habarigani. Munzuri. <laughs> Asante Sana. <laughs> Alafia. Hello. I want home to say. Madasi. Okay. <laughs> Wonderful to hear the sound of, of African languages. And uh, my brother here, who uh, is been praising everybody else, um, is a linguist, has been studying African languages, which is something that I think we all need to do. Certainly, we should attempt to um, learn one, um, because I'm of the opinion that uh, we're not ready for this first slide. Hello, thank you. Um, as we begin to reconceptualize from an African center, it will require that we do so in the languages of our ancestors, in the languages which come from our center. So we are involved in a movement which is um, moving towards these languages. It would be great if that was lower, right? Okay. Um, it is really uh, with pleasure that I stand here before you, and it's been very exciting being in the company of my brothers and sisters who have come over um, from another part of Babylon. Um, and it is not that we are from the States, really. Uh, we are from Africa. We are African. It is simply that a particular uh, experience has um, helped to develop our thinking because of some of the um, political movements that have occurred in the United States. So it's an honor for us to be able to come here and share this with you. And I think um, that those of you who are really interested in hearing more from people uh, here in this European country, that is, Africans who are here, uh, need to make the commitment that you will turn out in the same way for a conference that does indeed um, feature speakers, uh, African speakers that happen to be living in the UK. So that's the commitment you have to make. Okay. Um, 
Amos Wilson was a personal friend of mine, and we will be talking about him some tomorrow so that everybody will get to know him, but I just, I wanted to say that um, on a very personal note, I would be dedicating my remarks to him. Uh, Amos was one of the most uh, critical thinkers that I know. Uh, whenever he spoke, uh, never involved a lot of rhetoric. He always cut to the heart of things and was intensely uh, committed to uh, not only enlightening, but to organizing um, African people for African liberation. So these remarks are, are dedicated to him. In our analysis and our critique of, uh, Paul talked about doing white studies, we must begin always with the African worldview. Why do I say that? Because that is the beginning for us. It is the center. It is the core. It is the center uh, from which issues our most profound thoughts. And what the African worldview does for us is to provide a, a paradigm that we can use as a conceptual framework within which to place uh, European thought and behavior for critical analysis. As a matter of fact, we place everything within that context for critical analysis. And so always let us remember to center ourselves in the worldview that comes from us. And that means we've got to understand that. We've got to bring that to uh, a conscious level. The reason we have to move outside of the confines of European thought in order to effectively critique Europe is that you cannot defeat an enemy if you allow him to make the rules. If you allow him to even define the arena within which you go to battle so that we are in the process of defining the rules. We're in the process of redefining reality from our center. Because what the enemy does, if he's smart, we give him the latitude to define the rules and he'll do that in his advantage and he'll neutralize the natural advantage that we have. So what we're doing is taking back the right to define the rules. We've come to understand, we're coming to understand this more and more, that the most critical thing that our enemy has done is to control our thought process. And we're understanding that that aspect of the war is so much more damaging than those overt aspects, the things that are obvious to us. We've got to look deeply and understand the hidden dimension the dimension of the assumptions that we carry around with us that actually define us to ourselves as unworthy. We're usually not aware when we're doing that. And so what some of us are trying to do is to move to that deep level where we can come to understand that. And the concept of worldview helps us to do that. Worldview and culture are an essential grounding for us, for people generally. Culture is the context of meaningful reality. It is the way in which we 
We get order in our lives. It unifies our experience. It unifies us as a people, and it identifies us as a group. It tells us who we are, what to do. It's a collective value system which commits us, gives us a sense of purpose. Culture is therefore political, and it is ideological. Worldview, then, is the bedrock of culture. It's the bedrock of that experience. And in it, thought and culture come together. And that relationship is extremely important. Worldview is the way in which a group of people define reality. Brother Wade Nobles has told us how important it is to define reality for ourselves. Our worldview gives us definitions of truth, of being, of nature, of what it means to be human, of time, of space, of reality, of being. And so because of the importance of worldview, let us begin by talking about the nature of the African worldview. The African worldview is about connectedness. It gives us a universe which is a spiritual whole in which all being is interrelated and interconnected. It tells us that spirit is made manifest in matter, in material being. It tells us that Reality is so complex and so multidimensional that we must express it through symbols. And those symbols make up a system which is then expressed through mythologic. Mythologic. Everything has its logic. There is not only one logic. And so there is the logic of African symbolism. We speak of Kweli, truth, Sia, Oni, truth, enlightenment, understanding in African languages. And this is a process which makes use of the Mawu or feminine principle, which is joining, connective, holistic. In intuition, the knower and the known are joined. They become one. The inner and the outer are joined. Science, for us, is the way in which we seek to explain the universe systematically. It is, for Africans, a seeking of the essence of things, a search for meaning. Relationships for us are complementary and they are reciprocal. Male and female principles are necessary for wholeness. Communal forms are essential for life and human beings are born in sacredness. The self is personal, communal, and cosmic at once. And that self, that African self, that African being is affirmed by the natural order. Death is part of life, and death is necessary for rebirth. Sacred time transcends ordinary lineal categories. Rhythm is unity. Rhythm is the key of life. Rhythm is the connecting thread. It is the code of being. It is the method of science, of understanding. 
and it gives us the experience of harmony. The Dogon people talk about the process of knowledge involving the levels of jiri so word at face value, beniso, word from the side, boloso, word from behind, and so dai, the clear word. And we could perhaps interpret that as talking about moving from sight without understanding jiri so to sight with perspective, beniso, to insight, bolo so, to vision, so dai, the clear word, which then prepares us to receive sacred knowledge. This is an African concept of learning, of gaining knowledge, of the truth process. This comes from the African world view. And the Dogon, we can stop now, also tell us something else. They tell us about the beginning of things. In the beginning was Ama, Ama the creative principle. And Ama created all beings to reflect the sacred and divine principle of twinness, of complementarity. And so he made all primordial beings, each with a male and female soul, the twin soul, <coughs> except for one being, one being who in his arrogance wanting to compete with Amma and to be more perfect than Amma, tore himself away from the gestation process prematurely. And began to make things attempting to make things better than Ama could make things. And in the process, this being discovered that everything that he made was incomplete, incomplete like himself, for he was missing his female twin soul. That being was Urugu according to the Dogon people. Urugu in a flawed condition, deficient in being, could only create other deficient beings. In recognizing this, Urugu returned to Ama, seeking his female twin soul, but Ama either had given it away or had determined that that would not be available. And so Urugu was destined to search forever for that which he could never have, to search for a fulfillment which he would never find. And everything that he would touch would be destroyed because he was a being of destruction. So let us begin today with that symbolic statement from the Dogon people in mind. Let us begin a journey in which we will look at the inner workings of a culture 
which we could understand as a male manifestation without the wisdom of femaleness, an incomplete culture without wholeness. It is essential that we understand the workings of Urugu. Not because Africa doesn't have other enemies. We have and we do. The specialness of this particular enemy, and make no bones about that, it is an enemy, a formidable one is the way in which they have messed with our minds. The way in which the Europeans have enslaved the minds of African people. But we know that none but ourselves can free our minds. And that's the process that we want to be about and we want to get through it, get beyond it, so that we can be about the healing of our people and the reconstruction of African civilization. So with that, let us uh, begin this sojourn, see how we're going to work this through today. Um, and you're going to follow with me and help me as we do this. To begin with, in an analysis of the enemy, it was necessary for us to reconceptualize, that is again, to go outside of this system that had been used to enslave our minds, okay, or to kill our minds, as, as Bobby Wright would say, to commit menticide. To do that, we couldn't use the same concepts that they had given us. That's what we have to understand. We have to be creative and recreative. And we have to have the courage to think for ourselves. And so the first step was reconceptualization. And that reconceptualization would allow us then to look at the process of the manufacturing of European power, and to understand the mechanisms of European world domination. Ultimately, we're going to attempt to understand, or we're going to need to understand the spiritual implications of that domination and understand its, its implications for consciousness. What we come to through this analysis, which we're going to go through today, is that the European cultural construct is based on a concept of truth which implies European power over African people. It is a culture which gets its energy from destruction, which becomes destruction, which is destruction, for they are the destroyers. Their way is death without rebirth. They are the desert which knows no giving. So Aikwe Arma tells us in 2000 season. Why is the culture so successful at what it does? It is successful because everything in it, every aspect of the culture works for European power. Every aspect of the culture works for European power. That is what we have to understand. What is reality? What is truth? Each culture must define those things for itself. Each culture 
has a, a method that it uses to define truth. Truth can be defined as being spiritual and joining. It can also be defined as being materialistic and separating. The European definition of truth has no spirit, is a denial of spirit. It has no concept of ma'at. Now, how does that work? Well, remember Yurugu. If truth has no spirit, if truth is a denial of spirit, then who becomes the smartest people? Who becomes the most intelligent? If truth has no spirit, no connectedness, no relatedness, then everything can be regarded as lifeless matter, as dead things, as an object to be manipulated. And we've already today had several statements about the defiling of the earth. An interesting theme. Why should that happen? That can happen when the earth is considered to be an object. Then the earth can be defiled. So that in this analysis, we will be attempting to understand how the world was reconstructed in the image of the European using their system of thought. And we will try to understand how that reconstruction of reality supported, indeed, their imperialistic behavior, their enslavement of African people and their defilement of the earth. So I think with that we'll be get ready to begin our analysis, understanding that this comes from not only the world view of our African people, our Africanness, but that it is an analysis which is inspired with a passion for African liberation that comes from and issues from the depth of African spiritness, as my brother Wade would say. So let us take this journey together. We begin with the conceptual model. Can I have the first slide, please? To begin with, We have the seed, the cultural seed, the seed which is the origin, the essence. You can see the origin of the words uh, from Kiswahili uh, language down on the lower uh, left-hand corner. And this enables us to talk about the essence of a culture which then manifests itself in a will or energy principle of the culture, the vital principle. Um, the Utama Rojo, again, coming from the Kiswahili language. So what we do is to use uh, our languages in ways that will help us to look at a reality which um, uh, insists <laughs> that, we, we, uh, that we understand it. Utamawazo is culturally structured thought. Again, Utamarojo, Utamawazo are not 
to be thought as being separate from the Asili, they are manifestations of the Asili, the Asili being the seed of the culture, which then unfolds to form and develop the culture. Now, so far, this conceptual model we could use to um, perhaps to, to analyze any culture. I say perhaps because as you begin working with the model, you have to then change it. You have to, to adopt and adapt it to see what fits. And then you have to add things to it because we are in a creative process. That's very important. But now what we want to do is to take that conceptual model and make it specific, see what happens when we kind of plug in European culture. Can I have the next slide, please? Now we're making it specific. So what we want to do is to look and see what is the nature of the European Asili. And we can use those terms because we have the right to, because we're taking the right to, because we're defining reality. Term um, entropic, I'm using here, we speak in, in physics about energy that cannot be used for work. It's an energy process that moves towards disorder He's saying that that is the nature of the European Asili. I want you to keep in mind the story about Urugu. And who was Urugu? Who was Urugu? Who's with me? The incomplete being. The Asili is incomplete. Chronic disharmony is what it breeds, and it is about destruction. And because of that, certain behavior is generated because of this lack. That lack it then has to compensate in other ways. And the way in which they compensate is the seeking of control, of power where power is defined as power over other, not the power to do, not the power that comes from the exchange, the giving and receiving of energy. And then we have the Utamaroho, which feeds off of tension and conflict, not at home in the world, coming directly out of this Asili or manifesting the Asili. Tension. It is unbalanced, never at home in the world. And so it seeks control. Now, how is this done through thought? What does the Utamawazo do? The Utamawazo must restructure the world so that it is set up for the illusion of European power. And so knowledge becomes an act of aggression. And everything in terms of European thought brings forth confrontation. Paul earlier talked about dichotomies, the split, one against the other, not complementarity but confrontation, opposition. It's very different from the African worldview, which we looked at briefly earlier. And so because of this need for the relationship of power, there is the need to always separate the self from other, because there must be an other to have power over. There must be an other to control. There must be an other who is inferior to the superior self. That is a European need coming directly from the nature of the Asili. The object of knowledge for them 
becomes what they call objective truth. Now this is something that we have been duped by. It is a myth that has kept us from realizing our political strength and force. And we'll talk some more about that. So that this model becomes the model for all relationships. And it becomes the, um, the justification for European posture in the world, in the universe. So that the Utama Wazo is the cognitive manifestation of the Asili. That is, it has to do with thought. Well, the Utama Rojo is the affective manifestation. It has to do with um, motivation, with will. You put it all together and you get your rugu. Now, what this um, concept of the Asili allows us to do is to see consistency and to see pattern. Because one of our problems has been that we have not been able to understand how systematic is the European assault on African beings. We've not been able to understand how consistent is European culture and civilization in its um, um, seeking after dominance and power. So we are trying to understand the logic of that culture. And the Asili tells us the logic of it, how it works. It explains to us why they do what they do. The Asili becomes a, a centering concept for us, and it allows us to take the mask off of the European. Take the mask off of the European, so that no longer for us is their, their imperialistic, destructive, anti-African behavior hidden behind the, the rhetoric of academia the rhetoric of the church, the rhetoric of liberalism, for instance, so that we find ourselves wanting to talk about the exceptions, the good white people, and so forth. But we must always focus on the asili, which is the nature of the culture, which tells us the pattern of behavior, which then illuminates the meaning of the consistent history. If you look at history, you don't see the exceptions. What you see is the pattern, and the pattern has been the pattern of destruction. Why has it been a pattern of destruction? It's been that because of the nature of the Asili. They are threatened by the natural order threatened by connectedness. And that being threatened, that alienation, causes tension, inner conflict. It causes an insatiable need, desire for power and control. The Utamawazo then, the thought process, materializes the universe. Are you serious? <laughs> oh. Okay. okay, so what the Utamawazo has to do then is to materialize everything, turn it into matter, to eliminate spirit which for them is threatening. Understand, you're talking about a people who are threatened by spirit. All right, then you got to think about, well, what is the nature of the African? The African is spirit. They are threatened by us. We don't understand that. So the most effective thing that we can do to combat them 
is to be us. Now what this requires, this analysis, is that we look deeply into thought process and understand that it's, it's somewhat difficult because we're talking about things that we have never looked at. We've carried them with us, but we haven't looked at them. We're dealing with the level of assumption. An assumption is something that you don't question, that you don't know is there. But we've got to know that it's there now so that we can get rid of it and that we can have a new set of assumptions which fit our nature, which are natural to us. Let's go to the next slide, please. And um, this is in uh, the book, Urugu. Uh, and here we're talking about the process of objectification. Paul talked before about the eye. They're always talking about the eye. Well, what is this eye that they, that they identify? They say that there is this being that is the thinking being that, that uh, comes about from getting rid of whatever there is that is spiritual. That when you do that, and only when you do that, can you become a knower. In other words, can you think? You can only think when you get rid of spirit. Again, that serves their purpose. It's self-serving for them. If they're deficient in spirit and you say only uh, by getting rid of spirit can you think, then they become the thinkers, right? And we think of ourselves as the non-thinkers. You see how it works. Okay. So what is it that this knower can know? Well, the fact, they'll tell us. What is a fact? You know, fact is actually dead space and time. A fact is something with no meaning. It can only have meaning when you put it into a context. They tell you take it out of context and then it's something that you can know. That doesn't make any sense at all. So the knower knows this fact. And then by taking it out of this context, by taking it out of experienced reality, we end up with an object. What is the object? That which can be manipulated. And so Africans become objects. And nature becomes an object. And the universe is objectified. And they say that by doing this, then you can have pure thought. And you can be rational. And what rationality means for them is the imposition of their minds on the universe. That's what rationality is. And they tell us, cogito ergo sum, je pense dont je suis. Right, my brother? I think, therefore I am. They end up with nothing. <laughs> but, uh, this being that has been divorced from the spiritual universe, and they tell us that that is thought. Now, what's in these smaller boxes here that you probably cannot read is that what is created in this, the, through this process of objectification is that you have a European controlled ego. They say is then able to control their emotional being. It detaches itself from the senses, denies spirit, which it fears, and then dominates objects, the objectified other, nature, us, African people. And so then the illusion is created of their power, and that is what the entire culture is about. It is about how the illusion of their power works. It is about the creation of that illusion. And the next box tells us that all of this is supposed to convince us then, which it does, of this thing called objective truth, which itself is based on the denial of spiritual reality which is predicated on self-alienation. You've seen that already. Self-alienation. You are separating one part of the self from the other part of the self. 
And they say you have to do that in order to think. It is a method of control which the Asili needs. And it is a method which implies the devaluation of the African self and the source of African knowledge, which is spirit. It is a method which justifies African enslavement and African exploitation. And that is basically what is being argued in the book, Urugu. So what we see here then is a closed system, which is self-perpetuating. The creation of the object, the object which breaks the rhythm. And what happens then in the working out of the culture is that in various periods of their history, different institutions come to the fore and become the mechanism for the creation of a European national consciousness. That is, um, for the statement of European power around which the people in the culture come together. Okay? Now, all of the institutions do that, but at different periods in their history, different institutions will come to the fore. What we've been looking at here really um, comes to the fore during the, the, the period of what they call classical Greece. Um, and you see it in Platonic thought, and you see Plato create this, the institution being the academy which is to carry this, this way of thinking, this concept of truth. And that becomes one of the, the, the first places within which uh, the European is defined as European, even though we're talking about an early period. Okay, you're getting a model here, which later people will identify with so that they can call themselves and consider themselves to be European. At another period, it becomes the Christian church. Well. <laughs> At another period, it becomes industrial capitalist order. Another period, it becomes science as they define science. Uh, we could talk about the EEC or, the, or really a European uh, dominated world order. Every institution is an expression of the Asili, every institution within European culture. Now we're gonna look at uh, a specific institution and see how it uh, expresses the Asili. Can I have the next slide, please? And here we come <laughs> to an institution which African people have probably supported more loyally. Uh, you know, than, than Europeans themselves. But that's because we didn't understand how it works. What Christianity does, if you use an Asili analysis, is to unify the conquerors while it pacifies the conquered. Okay? Unifies the conquerors. And that's the role that it played. It had to bring Europeans together. Because previous to this period of the early church, Europeans were not united by their religious practices. Do you understand what I'm saying? Okay, the Asili was already in place. But they didn't have a religion which told them why they should conquer the world. And that's what Christianity did. But we should also say that at the same time, what this religion said was that we should be peaceful. 
we meaning the victims. <laughs> now, what is proselytization? <laughs> Big word. It is cultural aggression. That's what it is. It is a posture which says, I have religion, you don't. I know you don't. So I can come into your culture, I can come into your home, and I can tell you what to believe. Now that's just out imperialism to me. And that was the posture that Europeans had when they brought Christianity into Africa. The only reason that African people are Christians is because African people were enslaved. The religious statement reflects the nature of the culture. It is patriarchal. In it, nature is identified with sin and with evil. Nature is to be controlled and so forth. You can read what's up there on the slide. Very, very different kind of um, um, interpretation of blackness than you would get in an African worldview where uh, Brother Richard King can talk about the black dot being the doorway, right, to consciousness and to the depth of consciousness. That's not the imagery that you get in the Christian statement where blackness is evil and whiteness is good. This is devastating for African self-concept. And we have to understand that. Now, what did Christianity do for Europeans? It helped to develop a national consciousness for them, which would enable them to have an imperialistic posture towards the rest of the world. And so you can read about Constantine, who said he had a dream. And his dream, a cross, came to him. And that cross had an inscription. And the inscription was, conquer by this. Now that's what Constantine said. Okay? That's what he said, the cross said. I didn't say it. He said it. And so he had a cross made and then went into battle and he was successful in battle. And so then, he becomes emperor of Rome and says that he has been chosen by the one true God to go throughout the world and bestow this gift on everybody else. Just happens that that also meant that the Romans would control everybody else as well. That is the meaning of monotheism for Europeans. It is not about the oneness of, a, of the universe. It is about having one emperor. It is about monolithic control the control of everybody else by one group of people. That's what monotheism is for them. But we have been defensive because they have used the term to proselytize their religion, which is really their ideology. And they have said Africans are polytheistic while they are monotheistic, which is morally superior, they tell us, and we have become defensive and said, oh, no, 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 no. We're monotheistic, too. <laughs> and so we want to deny 
the Orisha, the Abasum. We want to deny nature because we want to be like them. But we never ask the question, what does it mean to be monotheistic if they are defining the term? It means conquer by this is what it means. It means absolute control and domination. What did Christianity do for Europe? It explained to them who was we and who was they. It explained to them that if they called themselves Christians, they could then go throughout the world exploiting, destroying, and dominating heathens. And who were the heathens? That was us. That was the African. We have to understand that that has been the function of Christianity for Europe. And that is why the European Pope could say, go throughout the world and reduce all infidels to servitude so that that could rationalize our enslavement as a people. This is a history that we cannot ignore. Even though we have become dependent on these thought forms as an escape from the mandate, the accountability that we have to our ancestors who were enslaved by these people, even though we have attempted to escape from that into a religious statement which told us to turn the other cheek. We must have the courage to give it up when we need to. And see, to give it up does not mean that you're going to be left with nothing. The only reason we think that is because of the state of ignorance of self that we have been in. Because we come from a wellspring, a depth of spiritual philosophy like none other. And it's just waiting there for you. All you have to do is to come home. Next slide, please. Okay, we'll go quickly, as quickly as we can. This is also in the book, and we move to how aesthetic works to achieve European dominance. You see that it works, in aesthetic is their concepts of beauty, what gives them pleasure. Uh, always there is this separation uh, from nature a very, very different um, kind of experience in what they call art and what Africans are doing, what we are doing as we are being creative because we are seeking always um, to communicate the inner essence and power that is within us, is within nature, and we are seeking to, to uh, communicate with the Orisha, with the creator, as we create things, okay? Whether it be sculpture, whether it be poetry, song, whatever it is. Very, very different thing is going on in terms of what Europeans call art. But I want to look at one specific area um, this afternoon. And that is so that you can see in a very real way how aesthetic concepts can be used for political control. get real personal here. And I love to use the example of ballet. And like to ask um, sisters in the audience who have had the experience of being taught ballet when they were young. Any hands? Let me see. Not too many, huh? <laughs> Well, that's, un that's, that's good, if that's true. 
It's unfortunate if you're just not talking about it, because I want you to think about what that is, but you can think about it anyway. What happens in those ballet classes is that you stand at the bar. I wish we had more time for this, because I love to see people do it, you know, themselves. But you stand at this bar, right? You stand it like this. And the teacher comes around. And what does the teacher do? Say it. You who didn't take ballet, tell me what you said. <laughs> what? But what does the teacher do? Just tell me that. Makes you stick your behind in. Okay? I'll say that very clearly. Goes around pushing you in. So you, you stand, you know, and you try, to, you try to do everything that you can to hide that. How can you do that? You can't do that. Why can't you do that? Because that is you, okay? Now, not only is that you, but in the African aesthetic, that's beautiful. But they tell, this is very serious, little girls, we had this experience, that that is ugly, that somehow you get the feeling that you're not even quite human, you know? And so you're trying to change something that you can't change to look like somebody else. In addition to that, you take your hair. They tell you can't be in braids, certainly can't be in an afro, okay? <laughs> it's got to be pulled back very tight with what they call a classic bun. So they're, they're telling you this is a form of dance you gotta have a certain physique for, certain kind of hair for, wear your hair in a certain way for, right? Then the other thing that they do is they, the only reason we were in those classes was because they said you had to learn ballet before you could learn any other kind of dance. They didn't really want you to do other kind of dance, but if you were going to do it, at least this had to be first. Why would it have to be first? They told you that you learned technique in ballet. Remember all those things, all those myths? They also, if they listed, they put words next to it. If you wanted to learn African dance, in, in those days, they didn't say African dance. They would say ethnic. <laughs> now, what does that do? You have to understand the language that is used. Ballet was classical dance. How did that come to be classical dance? Because classical is the universal. The ethnic made it particular. The universal was more than, was superior. The particular, you see, is lesser than. Which came first, ballet or African dance? <laughs> It's a very sad um, manifestation of this use of the African aesthetic that we see now when we go to the continent. This use of, of, of aesthetic to, um, to destroy the self-image of a people. Our sisters in Ghana, in Senegal, in Nigeria are using harmful poisons, chemicals on their skin to change the color of their skin. The color is, um, is very strange, very strange. It looks sick. Um, 
the skin, it, it thins the skin. A physician told me that it, it can't hold sutures anymore, so that if you had to, um, if you had to have surgery, you couldn't have it. I mean, I don't know what they would do. That is such a statement of self-hatred that has been systematically created by the European aesthetic for the uses of European control and domination and is part of the process of colonization. It's so deep. We can stand here and talk about this now and with all the information that we have now, but understand that this is going on today to a greater extent than it was going on, say, 10 years ago, five years ago. And I can tell you that, because I was there then. What does this mean? At the same time that I'm telling you that we are spiritually so knowledgeable, if we ever let that come to the surface, I can also tell you that if you are in Accra, Ghana, and you are driving along the road, that what you will see will be these huge billboards of a being that they call Jesus, that has this scraggly blonde hair and this white skin in a African country, a black country, you're looking at this image. That is the power, you see, of the use of that uh, religious system and of the aesthetic. You combine all of those things together. What does that say? Okay, let me see what this says. <laughs> No, I had determined that we would not do questions now, that we'll have them for the next period. So that gives me five minutes. <laughs> okay, uh, next slide, please. I'll, I'll go through the rest of the slides quickly. Um, now, the power relationship that they need you will always see this consistent principle of, of, of creating a dichotomy where you have to have a comparison, which we call invidious, meaning that where one side is good and the other is bad. They have to have that. That's the only things work, way things work for them, okay? So that in order for them to have a positive self-image, there must be a negative image of what they consider to be other. That is where we come in. We provide the negative image of other, which is necessary for a European positive self-image. The discipline of anthropology, for instance, was very instrumental in creating the negative image of other as primitive so that they could feel superior being civilized. They defined civilized in terms of what they were. We became the opposite, which was primitive. So that in not only making these definitions, but in um, us internalizing them, you see, we become part of that process of our own domination. Now, I'm not blaming them. I'm showing you how it works, how it's the mind, and how systematically they work to do that. So if they could get us to accept this negative image of ourselves, then we lose our power. We're the majority. We lose our power. The image they give us of ourselves is as a minority. And so we go around calling ourselves minority. We do that all the time. It's craziness, but that's what we do, okay? It enables them who are a minority, a small minority of the world, to gain power over the majority of the world by successfully putting forth these images. 
Let's move to the next slide. Uh, let me see how quickly I can do this. Well, let's just focus on one point here, and that is, if you look at the smaller uh, triangle, what happens is that there's a certain style of behavior that we don't have time to go into now, but that, that happens within the culture itself. That is how Europeans treat other Europeans. Okay, and that's also linked to how they think about nature, how they think, how they define what it is to be human. Okay, and remember that self-alienation and remember the incomplete being and so forth and the inability to join. Now that causes a lot of problems in terms of what we would call interpersonal relationships. One of the things though that it's characterized by their behavior is that it's aggressive. All right? But this is within the culture. Now, it's got to be limited. Why? Why has the aggression got to be limited within the culture? <laughs> they would destroy each other. Thank you, Sister Abba. So let's move then to the larger triangle and look at how they behave towards others. What happens here? A concept is constructed of the cultural other, and the cultural other is that person, that culture, that can be totally destroyed at will, can be dumped on, is worth nothing. That is the true object. And what happens is then that that aggression can be displaced onto the cultural other. And they understand, they understand this on a conscious level, that as long as they have us to destroy, then they can kind of keep things working within their culture without destroying each other. I say kind of because it's breaking down. It's definitely breaking down. Now, a very important part of this is the, what is in between the two things here. And there you will see what I've called the rhetorical ethic. The rhetorical ethic. That is what messes us up. Because the rhetorical ethic is nothing but rhetoric. It is a statement which Europeans construct for, for exportation. It is a statement which is constructed for there would be victims. It goes like this. It says, we are interested in the well-being of all humanity. We are all human beings. Um, we are all brothers under the skin. Uh, we believe in universal brotherhood. Those kinds of statements, okay? Uh, or we come here to bring you love, uh, the, the missionaries. What these statements do is to disarm us because we don't understand them because we don't understand the acelia of the culture. And if we did, we would interpret them in terms of the acelia of the culture and understand that they have come to try to destroy us. So what the rhetorical ethic does is to mask raw aggression, okay? It masks raw aggression. But as we come to understand it, then we will begin behaving differently towards those who would destroy us. Let's move to the next uh, slide, please. Okay, here we have how these statements become ideological. Universalism, as we've said before, very important. The syntax of universalism. What happens? You notice um, how now what is being said in the states, I don't know if they do it here, but now they're talking about how there's no such thing as race. Not interesting? Uh, Newsweek magazine, what color is black? Suddenly, it's not supposed to matter anymore. 
and we aren't supposed to identify, okay? Because the greatest threat to their power is African national consciousness. <laughs> but if we don't understand, what happens is that we get tricked by the rhetoric. And so what we say is, oh, I just want to be human. I want to be um, the best lawyer. I don't want to be a black lawyer. I want to be a lawyer. Okay, our mother didn't have lawyers. They had a black child, an African child, right? So what this universalism does is that it keeps us from understanding their nationalism. Their nationalism is expressed in universalistic terms. That's what we have to understand. We have to be able to identify the statements of European commitment, value, and objective, goals, intent, and so forth. We have to understand what they are committed to and not think that what they're talking about is some universal truth or science or knowledge or whatever the heck they say it is. Now, the Asili is always the same. So that the Asili, as you see in the middle, is seeking energy by imposing disorder on the world through racial and cultural domination. Well, what is progressivism? This ideology of progress we really get caught up in. You see how tricky this stuff is, how subtle it is. These are the aspects of European domination that are so subtle that it's the most difficult thing for us to deal with. We want to be progressive. And so what we do is we imitate them. And that's what brothers and sisters on the continent are doing. We are trying to rediscover our Africanness and they are trying, like everything, to be European. And it becomes our job to show them the beauty that is within them, to let them know that they are the source, that we are the source. In the 19th century, the British Empire could speak with pride about the various people around the world that they had conquered. And they could justify that by saying that we brought progress to these people. They could do anything in the name of progress. We have to look at what do they mean by progress? What is meant by that? Are they morally superior to us? Because they have more television than we have? <laughs> these are the questions that we have to ask ourselves so that then we can neutralize the ideology of European dominance. And we can define for ourselves what progress is for African people, given African goals. Next slide is uh, the summary of all of this, where we see that the Utamawazo here is the way in which the universe is reordered so that the Asili can be uh, uh, fulfilled. Over here, you have the Utamarojo, which is the um, way in which the uh, Asili expresses itself and seeks to fulfill itself. It's the will of the culture. These then, which are mutually supportive, are manifested in the various aspects of the culture. And so we end with a system of death a system of destruction. Hopefully, this system will self-destruct. But what we have to do is to ask ourselves what will happen to us in the meantime, in the process of their destruction. I want to give you an example which is very close to home for you of what we use the term Eurocentrism. But I think the more we use it, it, there's a tendency for it to become trite. 
and that we don't really understand the depth of the meaning of that term. And I was reminded of it on my previous visit to this country. I want you to listen to this. The prime meridian of the world runs in a straight line from here, that's a particular point, to the North and South Poles, with one foot on each side of the line. Now this is a place that's at Greenwich, okay? You can stand in the eastern and western halves of the globe at the same time. When you press the button, there's a machine and they give you a little piece of paper. On the front of this machine, you will be issued a certificate recording the exact moment to the nearest hundredth of a second GMT. What's that? Greenwich Meridian Time, okay. That you stood on the prime meridian at the center of time and space. <laughs> That is a Eurocentric definition of reality. And it's real. You go there and that's what they tell you. And you stand there and you say, oh, isn't this nice? And you put your quarter in the machine and so forth. The center of time and space. How could they do that? Well, the way they could do that, let's move to the next slide and I'll end with the next one. Now let's look at this process. We begin with the acili. Remember the acili, the seed that needs power. We go to the right, and in needing that power, it creates the utamawaza, which is the way that they have to think in order to prepare the world for their power. That is then based on objectification, which is a process through which the universe is um, despiritualized. Okay? And they degrade nature. They then build institutions which are based on, founded on these concepts or this way of understanding reality. In those institutions, we are then taught to think according to their roles. Remember about the enemy. You can't allow the enemy to make the rules. So we go into those institutions, we're taught to think according to their rules, we are educated in their truth. And that results in Africans defining ourselves as inferior objects of European domination. We are trained then to accept the system of global white supremacy as truth. Go back up to the Asili and go left now. The Asili must seek to fulfill itself. In so doing, one of the things that happened was Plato made a discovery. And he discovered that if you could define the rules for thinking, for defining truth, what they called epistemology, and make it into an ideology, that is, say that this is the only way to think, there is no other way to think that then you could, you could use that politically. And so we established the institution of the academy based on a concept of truth where truth wasn't supposed to have any meaning. It's all supposed to be theoretical, all supposed to be practical. You need to look up the, the, the word academy. Um, look for also uh, Academus, the story of Academus and see what that's about so that it's based on objectification, on rationalization, which really means total control of the European mind. And that academy became a training ground for the dominant to learn how they were to rule.